Okay, thank you. So, capital flows in the European financial crisis. So, I'm going to talk about a number of things. So, for those of you who aren't economists, I'm just going to um, go through some definitions. What are current account balances, stroke capital flows? Why are they important? I'm going to talk about that briefly. And then I'm going to talk about the two main explanations among policymakers for current account balances in Europe. One is de declining competitiveness, and the other one is uh, public sector spending. And I'm going to argue that actually these are not very good explanations, and that really we should conceive of current account balances or capital flows, they're two sides of the same coin, uh, differently. Uh, causality runs from the financial to the real, so I'll explain what I mean by that in due course. Okay, so what are current account balances? So it's just a brief definition. So suppose that this is an economic entity, uh, for example, a country or whatever, and this circle, or whatever it is, the size of this uh, circle, uh, shows how much that country can produce. It is the size of its uh, productive capacity in a given period of time, and it is a closed economy, so how much it can produce determines how much uh, people in this economy can spend, how much they can consume. So if you think of, say, a desert island with one shop, how much that shop produces determines how much the people on that desert island consumes or spends. Okay? But for some reason, uh, people in this economy, they decide to spend or consume this much. This is how much they're producing but this is how much they are spending. They're producing this much domestically, but their overall spending or consumption is this much. So the current account balance is the shortfall between spending and, sorry, between production, domestic production, and uh, consumption. It is the difference between these two, okay? So in order to be able to, um, spend or consume this much while producing, only producing this much, it has to borrow from the rest of the world, okay? It has to borrow from the rest of the world. So the current account balance is equal to the difference between these two, and this shortfall is met by equal and opposite borrowing from the rest of the world, capital flows. These are the capital flows. So the current account balance is equal to capital flows. Capital flows is how much you are borrowing from the rest of the world on aggregate. Okay? So note here that uh, I'm saying in the conventional view, causality is running from the real to the financial. It is the decision by people in this entity to consume this much while only producing this much. Okay? So the current account balance is the difference between these two things. And this is equal to how much you're borrowing capital flows. Note that the current account is approximately equal to exports minus imports as well. Now, this relationship breaks down uh, in Ireland, but for most countries, this holds true. And if you think about it, it sort of makes a little bit of sense intuitively. I won't go through it thoroughly, but if you're exporting, this means that you are producing something at home, but you are selling it abroad. If you are importing, this means you are consuming it, but you are not producing it here. So the greater the amount of imports, the greater this deficit is. The greater, you amount, the greater amount you have to borrow from the rest of the world. Okay? And why is this important? Because it is argued that in Europe, the peripheral countries, they had these current count imbalances. They were not, they were consuming, they were producing, sorry, they were spending more than they were pro producing domestically, so they had to borrow from the rest of the world, especially other European countries. And these foreign borrowings, these caused housing bubbles and financial crises in the peripheral countries, Ireland, Spain, Greece, and Portugal. Okay, so just briefly go through some more why housing bubbles might occur from foreign borrowings. So note that much of cross-border flows uh, is mediated through the domestic banking system. 
SME lending is risky for banks. Banks generally don't like to lend to SMEs because SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, they cannot um, post collateral if the loan goes bust. And also, many SMEs fail compared to more established big businesses. Okay. Um, also note that big businesses, insofar as they do finance themselves externally, they tend to bypass banks, they go directly to financial markets, they borrow using bonds or maybe they issue shares. As a result, if you have these foreign inflows, this is unlikely to lead to productive um, lending. It is likely to go into increased mortgage lending or increased speculative activity. And this can produce housing bubbles. Okay. So, what are the dynamics of current account balances in Europe? So, this is the current account balance. This is a shortfall uh, between production and spending, or maybe the other way around, the surplus between production and spending. So, maybe it's not so clear, but this line here is Germany. So, Germany had, especially starting in the 2000s, it had very large current account surpluses. This means that it was spending less than it was producing. It had a surplus and it was sending these surpluses abroad. It was loaning to the peripheral countries. And note that the peripheral countries had large um, current account deficits. They were spending more than they were producing. So-called living yonder means that awful expression. And note especially that uh, this is Greece, particularly large, uh, I think that's Portugal, Spain and Ireland. Ireland's not so big, but I'm not going to consider Ireland because I'll explain in due time. Okay, so one of the main explanations for these large imbalances uh, is that in Germany, unit labour costs stagnated. That is um, one of the main measures of competitiveness. Uh, unit labour costs is the amount of labour cost you need in order to produce one unit of output. It's not, there's lots of problems with it, but it is measured, for example, in euros per haircut. It is the amount of, uh, amount of money you have to pay to your employees in order to produce one unit of output. So remembering that the current account is approximately equal to exports minus imports. So in Germany, labour costs stagnated, but in the peripheral countries, labour costs increased a lot. And as a result of these rising unit labour costs, export, the, so the argument goes that exports became uncompetitiveness. So the current account imbalances, according to this view, is explained by the fact that exports fell in these countries as a result of rising unit labour costs. Okay, but this is problematic for a number of reasons, in my opinion. So here it is, we're looking at Spain's um, trading partners. Note that indeed um, Spain has a large trade deficit, this is Germany here, Spain has a large trade deficit with Germany. 30% in this year of its trade deficit, that is the shortfall between exports and imports, 30% of its trade deficit is um, borne by Germany. But note that from 2002 to 2008, actually its trade deficit with Germany declined throughout this period. And insofar as it lost competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis another country, it's best explained by China. Its trade deficit with China increased a lot, but its trade deficit with Germany decreased a lot despite its rising unit labour costs relative to Germany. Uh, similarly with uh, Greece. Um, this is Oh, it's hard to see that actually. I think this is Germany, this dark line here. Uh, so note that the trade deficit fell vis-a-vis -vis Germany as well, and it rose vis-a-vis -vis, um, China as well, uh, um, exactly like Spain. Portugal has a similar story. 
I'm not going to consider Ireland in here because in Ireland exports minus imports doesn't really equal the current account deficit because of the large presence of multinationals and all these kind of dynamics which obscure things. Okay, so why might this be so? Why has uh, Spain and Greece not lost competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis Germany? Well, one reason is that actually uh, unit labor costs are only one component of exporting costs. Um, especially in the export sector, the export sector tends to be slightly more sophisticated than the non-exporting sector and as a result it's more capital intensive so that um, rising unit labor costs does not necessarily cause a huge competitive loss. But in my opinion the most important reason is that actually Germany and Greece and Germany and Spain and Germany and Portugal they're producing completely different things. If you look at Germany's uh, sort of trade and exports, they're very sophisticated goods. So this is a ranking of different countries' um, exports in terms of their complexity, how sophisticated they are. So basically, Germany is producing very sophisticated goods. Germany and Japan rank at the top of the ladder in terms of uh, sophisticated goods, but Greece and Portugal very much at the bottom of the ladder. So basically Germany is exporting mobile phones or whatever and Greece is exporting feta cheese to make an extreme example so that actually, you know, you know, labor costs, they're not competing against each other basically, okay? <coughs> All right, so this is an alternative explanation for uh, current account imbalances. So, note here we start with the financial sector. We start with the financial sector. And the financial sector decides to loan money to some country. And why does it loan money to a country? Well, this is obviously facilitated by the euro, which uh, had lowered interest rates for banks in the core but also the euro implies an absence of exchange rate risk, so it's much less risky to loan money across borders. But also there is also generally a waxing and waning of confidence in financial markets. So basically banks in the core, they decide to loan to banks, or sorry, to countries in the periphery. And then as a result of this lending, the peripheral countries, they decide to spend or consume more than they are producing. Okay? So this is a different way of conceiving it. So note here that causality runs from the financial to the real. Okay? It starts with the decisions of banks. Okay. So back to unit labor costs. So basically, we have an increase in lending. So this is the chain of causality. We have an increase in lending uh, in the core to the periphery. This causes an increase in economic growth. Okay, this is pretty, uh, pretty standard. Increase in economic growth tends to result in rising unit labor costs. Why? Because when there's economic growth, employment falls. When there's a fall in employment, workers are able to bargain for more and higher wages and employers can be less picky about who they hire. An increase in unit labor costs then results in an increase in imports because workers basically have more spending power now because of higher wages. And it is the increase in imports which drives the current account. So remember what I said earlier that the current account is equal to exports minus imports. So I'm saying that this is the chain of causality rather than rising unit labor costs causing a decline in exports. I'm saying it's actually an increase in imports which is driving current account imbalance. Okay? So here's some proof. Here is Spain. Note in Spain, okay, the current account was in deficit here, but the current account really deteriorated between 
2003 to 2008. The current account really deteriorated between 2003 and 2008. And here is exports here. Okay? Between 2003 and 2008, exports, well, they didn't change much. If anything, they grew slightly. Okay? But look what happened to imports. Between 2003 and 2008, imports really increased a lot. So quite clearly, the deterioration of the current account is being driven by an increase in imports in this country. And the decline in exports is just not evident. Okay? And notice here, as kind of just as an aside, that the current account is a mirror image of economic growth in Spain at least. It is a mirror image. So when there's an increase in economic growth, this causes uh, the current account to go into deficit through increased spending on imports. Uh, exactly the same picture can be made in Greece. So the current account here uh, deteriorates, but actually exports increase slightly of anything and clearly it is the increase in imports which is driving uh, the current account deficit. Um, and again, economic growth is a mirror image of the current account. Same story in Portugal. Current accounts deteriorates here, but actually exports grow slightly, but imports grow even more. So current account being driven by increasing imports. Okay, now I'm going to look at public spending very briefly. An equivalent way of looking at the current account, this is an accounting identity, is that the current account is equal to net public saving and net private saving. Net public saving is just the budget surplus. So why does this make sense? So if you think about it, if the public sector is saving and the private sector is saving, this means that overall that the economy is producing more than it is spending domestically. So if both of these are positive, this implies a current account um, surplus. And if both of these are negative, it implies a deficit. So this isn't an economic theory or anything. This is just true by how the variables are constructed. OK. And again, here, causality runs from the real to the financial. So if you look at, and many policymakers uh, say that actually current account imbalances are driven by increases in public spending, because basically this is equal to budget surplus. But if you look at Spain, throughout the 2000s, it's, um, this is the public, uh, net public saving here. So throughout the 2000s, its budget deficits were meager, and then they ran large surpluses. So quite clearly, the current account imbalance is, is not driven by uh, profligate public spending or the public deficit. It's quite clearly driven by large negative saving, that is, uh, borrowing by households and borrowing by businesses. Okay? It's not driven by public sector borrowing. Uh, similarly, in Ireland, um, we have we ran budget surpluses mostly through the 2000s, and it was large increases in private debt, which um, which overwhelmed um, the public saving. That is, how increased household debt and increased business debt. The situation is slightly different in Greece. So, in Greece, yes, you have large um, public. Uh, deficits, and we also had large private sector um, borrowing as well. And Portugal is a similar story. I'm slightly running for time here. Just as an aside, if you look at Germany, Germany actually ran budget deficits throughout the 2000s. Uh, so if you want to say that anyone was, you know, reckless from a public spending perspective, you can make a better case that it was Germany compared to Ireland or Spain at least. But the reason why Germany has a current account surplus is that this, uh, pro this uh, public 
deficit is overwhelmed by very large private savings. So individuals and households and business, they save in Germany. Mm -hmm. So to conclude, there is weak evidence for declining competitiveness as a cause of current account imbalances. Rising imports due to lending-induced growth a more likely cause. Swings in private savings greater than public savings, at least in Ireland and Spain. So it's an, you can't really lay the door at public spending either for these large current account imbalances. And thank you. So the, um, the liberal consensus yeah, for most countries is that uh, countries sign free trade agreements in order to promote and achieve the gains that accrue from free trade. However, there is plenty of evidence nowadays to suggest that free trade agreements don't achieve these aims. And this begs the question then, why sign these agreements? Um, this paper will, will argue that trade agreements are used to force through unpalatable regulatory changes and that trade deals are an integral part of intra-block new constitutional convergence. Uh, to investigate this, I'll look at two discrete parts. First, I'll assess NAFTA. It's kind of the archetype for this type of agreement. And that will how it served the interests of financialized capital. And second, because the TTIP is between the US and the EU, which is comprised of uh, a number of um, economies which derive their comparative advantage from strong regulations, I'll critique the variety of the capital literature. Um, and I'll, this is to show how uh, institutions in these uh, states are gradually transforming. How, how they are transforming is through the political judicial project of new constitutionalism. And I'll argue that the uh, uh, project such as the TTIP serves the interests of European <coughs> firms who are as tied now to share, the metric of shareholder value as their liberal market uh, contemporaries. And the reason that trade deals our sign is that they were a vital component that enabled convergence between liberal market economies and coordinated market economies. So, the neoclassical argument between, for signing free trade agreements is that these agreements combine the benefits of free trade in a Ricardian sense with the relative ease of reaching agreements at a regional rather than a global level. However, before NAFTA was signed, there were doubts about its efficacy. Paul Krugman summed it up here. No effects on jobs in the US, produce only a small increase in US real income, probably to a fall in the real ways of US skilled labor. Um, and it's, he said it's essentially a foreign policy rather than an economic issue. And he said that there's a couple of studies at the time that said that it'll just really add 0.1% to US real income. Um, Brad DeLong, who is like a self professed neoliberal, uh, outlined in 2006 how. Uh, it, NAFTA had been a total failure for Mexico and that they were now no more uh, productive in terms of domestic income than their equivalents 15 years before and he sort of questioned whether or not a, a non-neoliberal strategy might have been better for Mexico. That's according to a neoliberal. According to Mark Weisbrot, uh by any metric that you can assess NAFTA, it's been a total failure. Uh, for Canada, there hasn't been many economic improvements either. It stands now as a sort of a, uh, a low-wage uh, economy relative to other advanced economies with low-paid employment, accounting for about 25% of the full-time workforce. The Dallas Fed also found that NAFTA had very little impact on um, trade between the U.S. and Mexico, and this isn't um, surprising because uh, there are already had been many uh, agreements in place prior to this. Um, so looking to the future, um, the, water, the current landscape, uh, there are two significant trade deals in negotiation, TTIP obviously, and also the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, I'll focus mainly on TTIP, but um, Regarding the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, it's been pointed out that conventional barriers to trade, uh, such as import quotas or 
import or export tariffs are, are already now so low that it's, it's hard to get large effects from any further reduction. And while it's possible to kind of argue that some gain is better than none, I think that uh, pro-trade uh, agreement advocates will keep on making these arguments even when the marginal effects of trade agreements become asymptotic. Uh, recent quantitative analysis of the TPP could only find uh, <coughs> gains, possible gains of 0.1% of US GDP. Uh, that, that's the figure they came up with but, uh, with regard to NAFTA improvement. So this seems to be a sort of like a relative figure that they only ever find a tiny, tiny, tiny marginal gain. Um, that study was designed with non-standard effects so to produce absolutely optimal results. And Dean Baker has argued that the TPP is not a good trade and its purpose is rather to change the regulatory process in a way that would certainly be opposed by most people if they were allowed a voice in, the, in discussions or, or a vote. And uh, I argue that trade agreements are now becoming sort of uh, a de facto constitutional governance structure for the global economy. And this is what new constitutionalism pertains. So a key characteristic of the political economy of the world order today as it now stands is how it's molded by the market revolution, which is apparent since the 70s. And that's associated with globalization and neoliberalism. And uh, while there's much recognition of the market revolution broadly, you know, was known as globalization, there's very much less uh, recognition that it's been facilitated by new constitutionalism. Um, so neoliberalism is institutionalized at the macro level by new constitutionalism, redefining global discourse via structural conditionalities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In particular, what we would look at is uh, regional agreements such as NAFTA, this and Treaty or the TTIP. Uh, and the purpose of these is how via uh, regional agreements, the, uh, the investor becomes the principal political object. He becomes the de facto, and in some cases, the de jure political sovereign with regards to international political economy. Um, so the signing of NAFTA in 1994 and in the following year the, uh, the General Agreement on Trades and Services, the CATS, were an important step forward for transnational corporations because it, they aim to secure the property rights and investor freedoms, freedoms on a global scale for transnational corporations. And rather than being simply trade agreements, they are obviously um, broader governance agreements and they're aimed at prohibiting and limiting the role of the state in regulating transnational corporations. Um, what was innovative about GATS and NAFTA at the time is that they fashioned uh, a new kind of political, political legal agenda which redefined services which were previously outside the remit of international trade rule setting uh, in their potential to like benefit and then allow exploitation by global capital. Um, along with this, the scope of these regulatory instruments within GATS and NAFTA tilted the balance of power in favour of international investment capital and service providers. And these agreements were signed when the faith in markets to be fully clearing were at, were at its highest. Uh, so therefore, uh, they were not written with the aim of regulating transnational corporations other than to protect sort of investor protections and freedoms, but rather these agreements are written in order to circumscribe the role of the state um, and uh, the way that the state might regulate transnational capital. And this was the decisive shift away from the general agreement on trade and tariffs. So, Uh, one of the principal concerns currently of, of political economy in the face of the pressures of globalization is the stability of regulatory systems and national institutions set against interstate economic competition, uh, attracting and maintaining capital investment, etc. And in the face of sort of this globalizing pressures, the argument is obviously that will these institutional differences survive or will the process of competitive deregulation uh, drive all economies 
towards a shared market model. And governments, are, it is argued, are under pressure to submit to changing their institutions such that they don't stand in the way of the deregulation of internal markets, uh, to reduce the tax burden on corporations, and uh, doing away with sort of like pro labor sort of like conventions and laws that, that raise you know, labor costs. Resistance to this normally comes in the form of the trade union movement and social democratic governments, and the strengthening or the uh, opposition to these is relative to how sticky the political institutions in these states are. Obviously, um, the international economic system offers capital far more exit possibilities than those labour. So, the argument is that the end point is, is convergence, with a race to the bottom where regulatory arbitrage leaves states with no choice but to lower regulatory standards and taxation in order to avoid capital flight. Now, the argument against this is, is generally the varieties of capital, which is that um, broadly in uh, national political economies can be compared to each other by examining how their firms resolve coordination problems. So a core distinction is, that is between coordinated market economies and liberal market economies. These are two distinct types, they're sort of like the poles of the spectrum along which all economies reside. Uh, liberal market economies, firms coordinate their market activities primarily via hierarchies and competitive market arrangements. Coordinated market economies, the equilibrium upon which firms coordinate is more strategic interaction uh, with, between firms and directors. So the new constitutional argument is not entirely sufficient in discussing the TIP, although it is sufficient for NAFTA. The reason behind this is because the US and Canada are both liberal market economies and Mexico is in the, the process of undergoing an evolution from a developmental state into neoliberalism. However, a good many of the nations in the EU, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Austria, Belgium, the Netherlands and Germany, they're all coordinated market economies. So while advocates of convergence would argue that the decades in the 70s have been characterized as gradually converging towards the Anglo-Saxon style of capital market based finance delivery. Points of the rise of capital would question where the process of uh, competitive deregulation will drive all economies towards a common market model. Uh, instead, they would argue that firms using comparative institutional advantage will it employ sort of in, uh, what's called institutional arbitrage to exploit new opportunities and the rest is sort of an inexorable slide towards convergence. For example, um, Nissan might locate its design facility in California, Deutsche Bank will acquire subsidiaries in Chicago and London and German pharmaceutical companies will open research labs in the United States so they can sort of uh, benefit from the uh, institutional frameworks in different countries. However, this kind of institutional arbitrage is pretty much unlikely to keep on occurring because of the calls for equivalence that is being uh, advocated for by leading business groups under the auspices of the TTIP. Um, a leaked document um, from the US Chamber of Commerce and Business Europe in 2012 argued that regulatory cooperation should include full equivalence. And in this context, um, full equivalence must be seen as a race to the bottom, given that that way lies the path of least resistance. Um, okay, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Okay. So, um, some of the main significant regulatory changes proposed under TTIP. Uh, the first one is market access and the negative list. Um, Business Europe and the European or the US Central or Chamber of Commerce have argued that the general rule should be that there should be full market access and national treatment should be granted for the provision of all services supplied across border. So this essentially is the, the opening up of all sort of like services to uh, private corporations. Uh, the knock-on effect of this is that um, any public authority that tries to, like, for example, sh uh, shield its local health services from corporate takeover faces 
a legal action from US firms, or US firms who might sue for compensation over lost process or profits because they can't uh, get into that particular sector. Um, and this can be quite, seen quite clearly from a, a recent paper by the, US, or the European Commission who argued that the current public utilities GATS exemption is increasingly not defensible and difficult to maintain in the context of negotiations with an ever more developed bilateral trading partners. So um, further concerns for the, the protection of public utilities and services from corporate takeover are contained uh, within that document. For example, the one of the most striking ones is the move now, the, the kind of inexorable shift towards what's known as negative lifts. Uh, so the negative list is, uh, entails that uh, the central obligations for the agreements of the details of market access, national treatment, most favoured nation, they must apply unless there is a specific carve out by the state. A positive list works under an opt-in approach. So NAFTA and most other agreements signed with the US favour a negative list, whereas in the past the EU followed the, the GATS approach of a positive list. Uh, recent negotiations between the EU and Canada adopt the negative list. Um, and so you can see that this is the general direction that that's headed. The other one is investor state dispute settlement, and this is the one that's getting a lot of media attention right now. Uh, and recently uh, there was a letter by 14 of Europe's uh, finance ministers to the European Commission calling for investor state dispute settlements to be kept include, this includes Richard Bruton by the way, who said this is a necessary part of my TTIP agreement. So there's been a number of investor state dispute settlement agreements. They're all you know pretty shocking as you can see. And each of these uh, public interest issue was challenged because of a potential loss of corporate profit with sort of like slight regard for the general good. Uh, these types of legal agreements, so like further, it's kind of like the chilling effect of of uh, uh, of any kind of uh, move by states to kind of protect their their services. Um, investor state dispute settlements really only uh, give their protection to like to one actor or one citizen, and that is corporations. And he argues, or it is argued that they violate three values held dear by the common law tradition, transparency, neutrality, and judicial sovereignty. Transparency is because uh, proceedings are held in camera so that the public may, or probably never will learn the, the micro issues disputed, or even in some uh, cases, the existence of a case. Neutrality is because it's disputed because um, regulations are allowed for the investor to, to nominate one judge on the panel. So already the, the, the weighting of the panel has, has begun be, like, before the proceedings have, have started. And judicial sovereignty is interesting because most um, international trade law is dominated by US firms. So therefore, the weight of, of US international law is, is weighted towards uh, US firms and obviously again sort of um, it favours US corporations and rather than protecting states or whatever. And uh, regulatory equivalence, uh, corporate lobbyists before the, the TTIP kind of gained some, some like traction in the media were, were quite open about writing how they would essentially co-write uh, the regulation. Um, this is sort of like been shown by some leaked documents from, as known as before, like the US Chamber of Commerce and, and Business Europe. Um, and they claim that the, uh, the TTIP negotiation process should be oriented <coughs> to allow stakeholders as well as uh, regulators uh, to identify entire sectors within uh, the economies that are right for equivalence evaluation. Um, and it appears that this is sort of a writ for a race to the bottom. Some um, 
uh, like equalisation that might happen would be car safety, road end cap. We have a, a sort of pretty healthy sort of like regulatory process where cars are tested in America. It's just self certification. Are you certified? Yes or no. Um, they would argue that there's going to be some kind of like mutual recognition, but these are impossible to uh, to um, formulate. And so essentially, they're just going to go with the one which is the, the least uh, difficult to implement, which will be self certification, will be the one that will be coming to. Again, European chemical law, there's 30,000 chemicals that are outlined in, in Europe. It will be unlikely that the, the burden will be shifted upwards, it will be shifted downwards. So therefore, this is what sort of like behind the border gravity roadblocks are. It's not really about trade or gains, it's about uh, equalization of, of these policies. Um, positives for the future. Uh, since I first started talking about this, uh, it was an awful lot of transparency whether or not the uh, the, or the the people would ever kind of hear about this. There was a massive letter writing campaign, and recently the European Commission was forced to hold a public consultation about investor state dispute settlements, and 150,000 people responded. So you can see that, like, you know, there are some positives for the future. Um, right, that's it. <laughs> Uh, so my paper is looking at, as I say, the EU strategy to further commitment to the ICC in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm looking at it from three points of view. So has the EU empowered African states to join the courts? Has it actually reduced it? Or is it actually being ignored in the policy instruments that it's using? <coughs> For those who don't know what the International Criminal Court is, it's a Hague-based uh, court. It is mandated to prosecute alleged offenders of most serious crimes of concern, so genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Uh, the court was established by a treaty, so the Rome Statute, in 1998, in which the majority of the world's governments overwhelmingly voted in favor of its adop adoption. Uh, just four years later, much to the surprise of even the most optimistic observers, uh, it was operationalized after it met the threshold of 60 ratifications. Today, 122 states have ratified the Rome Statutes. 33 of these come from Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, 36 individuals have been indicted. Um, controversially, all of them are from Africa, uh, including the Kenyan presidents, Uhuru Kenyatta, his deputy president, Wei Ruto, and also the Sudanese president, Omar al-Bashir. In response to this, the African Union has led, there's been a backlash among the African Union who have accused the, the courts of double standards, racism, uh, judicial imperialism, as well as labeling the courts uh, a European court for Africans. So the accusation is that uh, the European Union induced these African states to commit through, to the court through aid, and that legitimated uh, the indictments against African actors. Now, for the purpose of this discussion, I'll be speaking about the role of the European Union in persuading these African states to ratify the Rome Statute. But ultimately, this question stems from an empirical puzzle. So, just on the right, that just shows the depths of legal commitments to the courts among African states. Uh, so, in terms of ratification and implementation of the Rome Statute. But the empirical puzzle is, why did these African states legally or decide to legally integrate their jurisdictions into this Rome Statute system. By ratifying the Rome Statute, you're conferring authority to a third party institution, institution over extremely sensitive areas of sovereignty, so like the, the authority to define crimes and punishments over nationals. Um, it also empowers this third party institution to regulate and monitor uh, national security decisions. Furthermore, one could argue, and I think that this is the case even without the benefit of hindsight, uh, that many African states, because of the preponderance of conflict and political instability uh, in the region after the Cold War, as well as the collapse or uh, the prevalence of weak or collapsed judicial structures, some of these states were invariably going to be a target for the ICC. Perhaps not the target, though. Finally, unlike another state party such as the United Kingdom, uh, 
many African governments would not have the diplomatic resources to prevent an ICC case from proceeding. Now, the role of the European Union naturally arises as a point of inquiry when thinking about this empirical puzzle, given that the EU is the most enthusiastic champion of the international criminal courts, as well as being the largest distributor of aid to Sub-Saharan Africa. So, in 2001, three years after the Rome Conference, so the conference that negotiated for the creation of the ICC, the promotion of the ICC became an explicit objective of the uh, CFSP uh, through the adoption of a common position. In keeping with the objective of an international order based on effective multilateralism, the EU, the EU has from the beginning expended diplomatic and financial capital to the ICC cause. So from 1999, the European Commission um, provided generous grants to African civil society groups who subsequently set up ratification campaigns in these countries. Um, also during the Rome's uh, conference negotiations, uh, EU member states were in the vanguard of building a global coalition to support an institutional de uh, design based on hard laws and independent authority. As alluded to earlier, so the Council of the EU adopted co common positions in 2001, but also 2002 and 2003, which mainstreamed the ICC into the Union's external, external relations policy framework. So they basically provided guidelines for member states on the type of soft policy instruments they should employ towards promoting the ICC in third-party countries. And by promoting, I mean encouraging the states to ratify this treaty as well as domestically implement it. The soft policy instruments include raising the issue in political dialogues with third-party states. So during these meetings, a EU representative might express you know, the shared values between African states and EU, they might invoke like, the principles within the Kutenu Partnership Agreements, or they may allude to uh, AU, or human rights principles in the AU Constitutive Act. Um, but they all, the EU would also send out the marshes invoking rhetoric, similar rhetorical devices. And also offering technical assistance to states which requested it, in order for them to ratify and implement the statute. However, it was not until the Council adopted an action plan in 2004 that the EU and its member states agreed to a framework that systematically set out a coordinated strategy or a coordinated range of activities to advance global commitments to the courts. At the heart of this strategy was the establishment of EU and national focal points, uh, which were devoted to exchanging information on the ICC and establishing appropriate contacts where they could raise this issue, uh, but also identifying opportunities to include the ICC on a draft list of issues in negotiations and political dialogues. So by increasing the density, uh, consistency and flow of information about the ICC, it was to maximize the effectiveness of these previous policy instruments. In 2005, these policy instruments were complemented by the insertion of a legally binding ICC-related clause into the revised Kutenu Partnership Agreements. So the Kutenu Partnership Agreement is, like, is the framework for EU development assistance to African, Pacific, and Caribbean states. Uh, the clause asserts that partner, state, partner uh, states are obliged to take steps towards ratifying and implementing the statutes. It entered into force in 2008 with only Sudan refusing to sign it in protest at the insertion of this ICC related clause. This subsequently meant that the uh, European Commission could not disperse 300 million euro in aid uh, to Sudan. So it is at this point that we should consider whether uh, the EU has induced African states to commit to the ICC. The insertion of this ICC-related clause into a framework which deals with the distribution of development assistance has led many to believe that there is a formal linkage between ICC commitments and aid. Recently, in light of the AU backlash against the ICC, there is this emerging narrative that the EU foisted this ICC 
Uh, the fo voice of the ICC on two poor, dependent African states through aid inducements. However, the research I've conducted suggests that this is not really the case. So if we start by analyzing the Kugner Partnership Agreements, the provision related to the ICC is a non-essential clause. This means that if an African partner does not take steps to ratify the Rome Statutes or implement it, this will not lead to a consultation procedure um, where, the, uh, where the suspension of aid is discussed. For EU officials, multiplying conditionalities for political objectives is seen as counterproductive, particularly if they're not linked to uh, development processes and outcomes. And progress on ICC falls into this category and could have potentially disrupted the balance in Article 11, which dealt with democracy, human rights, uh, the rule of law. These three items were considered to be essential items. The provision is rather a soft political commitment, which legitimizes the consistent appraisal of each side's performance on committing to the ICC. So there is political pressure, as African governments are expected to adhere to the agreement, but it's not tied to aid. The reason Sudan lost aid was not due to its failure to ratify the Rome Statute, but instead its insistence on not signing the Kutnir Partnership Agreements because of the inclusion of the ICC related clause. Furthermore, African governments have had a role in defining the terms in which this ICC-related clause was included. In interviews with EU officials who negotiated for the inclusion of the ICC-related clause, they mentioned how the European Commission pushed for a strong and explicit reference to the ICC in negotiations, but African states or African representatives resisted and managed to negotiate for language that was much more politically flexible and gave African governments more discretion over the pace of committing to the ICC. If we test this hypothesis further and examine other observable implications, it becomes even clearer that aid was not a primary factor in explaining the patterns of African states committing to the ICC. So if we examine negotiations to create the ICC, the positions that African states adopted do not necessarily significantly overlap with their principal EU donors. So if we just look at the, the percentage of positional alignments at Rome Conference, the orange bars are a control sample of non-EU states uh, and African states, and the blue bars are uh, the positional alignments over issues discussed at the Rome Conference between EU donors and African recipients. And there's no real pattern emerging. And if you look at the bottom line, which says overall degree of positional alignment, shows that actually the control sample of non-EU states is stronger than um, the alignments between African recipients and EU donors. So this would suggest that African states favored the creation of an ICC independent of European uh, Europe European influence. Likewise, according to a survival analysis I tested, there is not a positive association between dependency on EU aid and commitment to legal instruments. I just sorry, finally, um, and in interviews with EU officials and African representatives, the respondents also downplay the importance of aid. For African political representatives, the attractiveness of the ICC was informed by the experience of the Rwandan genocide and the failure of the international community to actually intervene. So on reflecting uh, on the negotiations to create this court, um, African representatives spoke about how if the ICC was operational in 1994, the scale of killing in Rwanda would have been much less. As well as the fact that they were very attracted to this independent court uh, that was independent of the UN Security Council and was constituted by hard laws and was seen as a reliable institution that weak states could call upon in cases where atrocity crimes took place uh, and where the judicial structures have actually collapsed. So moving on to empowering, has the EU empowered these countries to actually join the courts? Empowering is an identity-based concept uh, and this identity is constructed by social relations. It has multiple dimensions. Um, firstly, the concept reflects how 
BU seeks to portray itself through external relations as an altruistic or a solidarity-based uh, normative actor in the international system. Secondly, the EU empowers third-party states through increased recognition. So the EU would portray this actor as an equal, or even similar to itself. But this concept is not strictly limited to identity construction. It involves a variety of practices and power resources, such as the transfer of knowledge, um, expertise, and resources. Now there is a paradox to this mechanism. Whilst empowering aims to treat uh, the other on equal footing, it actually emerges from a relationship of inequality. The empowerer has both the initiative and superior symbolic and material resources. And in order for this mechanism to work, this inequality has to be concealed for as long as possible. So an example of this would be um, when the United States forced a lot of weak independent countries to sign bilateral immunity agreements in order to protect their military personnel from the ICC's jurisdiction. And the EU uh, decided to actually compensate some of these states that actually lost aid, but it did not publicly disclose this. Like the official policy position on the ICC is that we use self-policy instruments. Uh, it didn't talk about the material rewards or compensations. A further dimension of this concept relates to just that example. So as the practice of disempowering others, which the EU, which the EU um, often uses against the United States. Uh, it depicts it as an opponent of international law, so referring again to these bilateral immunity agreements, the EU derisively referred to them as bilateral impunity agreements. So on a number of fronts, one could argue that these discursive practices and diplomatic resources aimed at empowering African states has actually contributed to African initial support for the courts. Although, as uh, I've demonstrated, during the Rome Conference, during the Rome Conference negotiations, there wasn't necessarily an overlap between African and European positions. African delegates did res positively respond to the EU EU's proposal that the court would be based on the principle of reciprocity and equality. And for a number of governments, African governments that were concerned that the ICC would be used as a vehicle for major powers to target weak states. This frame had enormous appeal and led a lot of delegations in the non aligned movements to then back uh, an institutional design based on independent authority and hard held governance provisions. But perhaps the most effective measure has been the EU's funding of national civil society organizations that provide on the ground technical assistance. From the Rome Conference, it was clear that the majority of African governments were in support of the ICC. However, many national governments lack the capacity to uh, overcome technical obstacles in the way of ratification and implementation. So resolving legal incompatibilities between national constitutions and the Rome Statutes. And the EU sponsored a series of regional conferences uh, hosted by EU-funded civil society organizations, uh, such as the Coalition for the International Criminal Courts and the Parliamentarians for Global Action. And during these, during these um, conferences, these organizations sensitize African governments to the court, as well as offering tailored technical assistance to overcome the technical challenges of ratifying and implementing the statute. In cases where ratification efforts have lagged due to the absence of national civil society mobilization, the EU's offer of increased recognition for regimes has led to states like Zambia and Cape Verde ratifying the statute. As for being ignored, um, the soft policy mechanisms have had little effect on authoritarian governments with more consolidated levels of statehood as well as elite strangleholds over the economy. So in countries like Angola, uh, Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, states which have very marginal liberal identities and are not compelled to tr actively try to raise its liberal status in the international system, the effect of this empowering approach by the EU, so expressing the shared values, offering technical assistance, uh, funding civil society organizations, and offering increased recognition, holds very little traction in these regimes. <coughs> 
These regimes have viable patrimonial networks that they derive domestic legitimacy from. So in this, in this sense, it insulates them, them from this uh, bottom-up pressure and above pressure by the EU and NGOs. And so without exercising material leverage over these countries, the EU's attempt to universalize the court have fallen on deaf ears among these more consolidated authoritarian governments. Okay, so that's it. <laughs> well, uh, so I'm going to ask you for, you know, if you don't mind as an economist to talk about the political dimension of your work. Um, so, I mean, essentially, it comes down to do we blame the peripheral countries or we do, do we blame the core country of Germany, you know, for uh, inducing these problems? But I was wondering, um, so obviously that has policy impl uh, implications, who you blame essentially mm. for, the, for the current economic imbalances. And, um, but I was wondering then also, I mean, it is necessary for elites in the European Union to understand the reality of the world, what's going on, okay? So I'm wondering, do you see your hypothesis come up in ECB studies and the European Commission studies? How, how, how do they deal with that? Well, they, they don't come up in ECB studies, but I would say, like, as of anything, it, it's kind of like an interaction between domestic and international forces. But certainly, if, if you look at, say, Spain and Portugal in Norway, and I think Greece, they had uh, current account deficits uh, actually before they joined the euro. And they had their current account deficits is actually driven by their importation of capital goods, especially sort of intermediate and machinery goods. So basically, these uh, countries don't have the capacity to, to build these high, higher tech goods themselves. So the current account balances did predate the imposition of the euro, but at the same time, I've definitely seen it being argued that their ability to conduct effective industrial policies was scuppered by them joining the European Union too soon in 1980-whatever, and that actually, the, um, although they probably benefited overall, uh, at least uh, up until 2000, uh, definitely their uh, industrial strategy was one that was skewed towards dependency on foreign direct investment and it was sort of retarded uh, domestic high-tech capability. So, you know, as with everything, it's kind of sort of interaction between domestic and international forces. Uh, I have a question for Rob. Yeah. <laughs> um, the lap of Italus yeah. graph. Um, if you if you lack of its graph, graph if you do it out to like 2013 or 2012 or whatever, all the countries come back in together, so they all they all kind of coalesce back along that kind of like central line. In, now, is, which was uh, current count balance. Current count, yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you put that down to sort of the suddenly the the outflows from Germany stopped, or do you put down to internal devaluation? Uh, no, it, it, it's driven by the fact that economic growth collapsed in these countries and as a result um, imports completely yeah. fell. People weren't importing as many goods. It's it's overwhelmingly driven by imports. So, so there's no like uh, agent behind that, it's just No, no, it, it's basically a sort of you know normal adjustment, yeah, shall we say. <laughs> <Not me. laughs> Just on the, the TTIP thing, um, it was a model of the thing a few months ago, and we're, we're trying to get some actual decent sources and information for TTIP. Um, where, do you, where have you been sourcing the material for that for research? Because it seems all very hidden and very. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very. Um, in terms of academic, uh, when, I, when I first started like, looking at this, I went and asked a couple of people, like, what's the, what are the goods are like academic guys and TTIP and they said there are none basically until the, the until I guess release, then they discuss it, but until then, no. So it's mostly NGOs. George Monbiot actually in The Guardian is essentially the, the leading light of, of TTIP analysis, like, and you know, he probably is the guy who collects most of the, the, the leaked documents. Uh, Corporate Observatory Europe is also a really good source, but like, 
nothing really academic, unfortunately. Like, yeah, that's you know. so it's, it's enormous in that before. Yeah. Just one of the last slides you were, you were talking about, there, one of the positive things there. Um, I'm not too sure about this, but I've seen that there's like a citizen's initiative, right? To get like a, a million signatures on the interview. Do you think those um, processes or the, like that procedure have any kind of real effect on the thing if, if they are forced to have a review or to look at it without any actually change or is it just. Um, just the, I think if you, if you kind of draw a parallel between, the, for example, NAFTA and TTIP. Mm -hmm. Um, NAFTA, the, the, the way it was managed in terms of uh, the transparency and all that kind of thing was that, for example, the, the, um, the international the US labor organizations had to provide their kind of congressionally mandated advice to the president before NAFTA and the, their draft copy was given to them 12 hours before they had to give him the advice. So that's kind of the way it was managed before, very much the way you might imagine like guillotining whatever happens in the Irish parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the sort of like people power that's kind of like convening against TTIP, I think is pretty much unique. How much how much effect it will have, I'm not sure, but they've certainly had more impact than any sort of like a trade agreement before. Like even just the, or sorry, but even just the the, um, the uh, making them look at the uh, the ICS is a, is a, is a massive start. Like seems to be kind of starting to. Mm -hmm. kind of yeah. And what's the future time frame for TTIP? I mean, what, what's the next stage now that they go to in, in terms of implementing it? Um, I don't think there's a there's a particular time frame. I think the the uh, this this uh, putting it out to kind of like public tender is slowing the process down considerably. I think it was it was it was the funny enough the uh, Snowden allegations. Like it, it should, the uh, negotiations should have been done by now. But but the fact that the NSA were spying on Merck and all that kind of that had a, that put a massive roadblock in the way, and that that slowed things down. So that's that's the reason why that not actually signed already. Like. Uh, just one for Kevin. Yeah, is there any evidence that um, bilateral trade agreements between individual EU states and individual national states plays a role? Yeah, that's, that's something I probably should have covered in the presentation. Uh, yeah, there has been bilateral um, financial assistance to the rule of law sectors for certain countries, but that's not that's only specific countries like Luxembourg, for example, will say to a government official, listen, if you can ratify this treaty, it'll be much easier for us to sell this aid to you in our parliament. Um, I don't think it's a major effect. I think the biggest effect on these countries is actually ratify and what needs to be understood about African states ratifying the ICC was that it was done mostly in the years after the Rome Conference where there was this you know, positive view of the ICC as being contributing to African states dealing with post-conflict situations. And it's only been in, since the last six years, you know, the indictment of Omar al-Bashir, that this country has suddenly said, wait, actually the ICC can target heads of states. For some reason, there was even though it's in the Rome Statute, like Article 27 says, there's an irrelevance of official capacity. Many African governments felt that this was not something that's going to target senior officials. So when they were actually agreeing to this, civil society organizations were engaging with them and saying, listen, this is a good thing, and you know, you'll get normative benefits from it, and so they, they agreed to it. So the aid pressure wasn't necessarily something that needed to be uh, in place for them to actually commit to this uh, ICC. Yeah. That's a point for uh, kind of just right then, and this is going to be my area now, sure. but uh, just in general, like the, I am aware of the kind of arguments that African states make that there isn't an undue kind of yeah. focus on them. Like, is there either from the EU or other um, international organizations or bodies or whatever that sort of um, attention paid to non-African states mm -hmm. to encourage and entice and induce them to join or to ratify or in the past even? Yeah, um, for countries that are emerging from the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. there's uh, positive conditionality, so it's kind of like more for more, so if you do ratify this statute, we will give you increased aid, mm -hmm. but that actually hasn't been 
that hasn't been used for sub-Saharan Africa at this point. Um, as of yet, but it could be used in the future. So, thanks, Kevin. Uh, you know, when you're talking about you know the states getting money to take this on, and like where the question of partiality there? <clears throat> how you know the judges who are the judges, the product of standing that they got after after the situation in these countries. I mean, it's it's, it's very complicated with the, the tribal warfare and that. Right. Where, 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 where are these judges? What do they actually come from Africa, from the African states themselves? Yeah, well, and one of the reasons that a lot of African states decided to ratify the statute was that only state members of the ICC can be allocated senior positions within the international criminal courts. So this is actually quite an attractive body, and in a sense, you can actually influence the courts by, you know, uh, having your nationals represented at these high levels. One of the problems is, though, that there's a lot of, like, they have a yearly events where all of the states come together, and when a judge's uh, time is up, they elect new judges, and there's a lot of kind of horse trading. And the quality of judges tends to not be great, so they don't really focus on merits, it's more about political considerations. Mm -hmm. So that is actually a huge criticism of the court, that they, the judges themselves are not uh, fully qualified for the positions. And at times there's a lack of considerations for the domestic context. And the huge debate at the moment is whether criminal justice mechanisms are actually relevant or effective in these situations. Like in Uganda, for example, local peace initiatives, in, or sorry, local justice mechanisms were seen as more appropriate than criminal justice mechanisms. But they actually exasperated the conflict. The SEC exasperated the conflict by actually intervening. So, there is this kind of distance between this hate-based body and what's actually happening on the ground in Africa in terms of the appropriate mechanism, mechanisms that they use uh, for emerging or transitioning towards uh, you know, peace and things like that. Thanks, yeah. Any other questions? Or yeah, so we're giving a round of applause for the last thing. Um, I suppose just really quickly, um, just while everyone is still here, I'm real, we'll make this really quickly, quick, sorry, just on behalf of myself and all, I'd like to thank all the presenters who have um, presented throughout the day. I know some are here, some have gone, but um, thanks to all, I'm sure it's as well when it goes up online. And um, thanks to the people who have attended as well throughout the day. Just a few names I'd like to thank, and again, on behalf of myself, Manolis, and in no particular order, uh, Veronica Barker and Linda Vines, just for their um, kind of logistical support in all of this. I'd like to thank the three um, members of staff who chaired the panels, so that was Aegon Makahi, Alice Feldman, and Sean Strange. I'd like to thank Usgi and Travis who have uh, operated the camera throughout the day for us. They took uh, uh, a lot of time out of their day for that, so we appreciate that. And I'd like to thank Dr. Diane Payne as well for our head of school, just for her support throughout this and putting it on. I'd like to thank uh, Oscar, one of our colleagues who covered some classes for me today to allow me to be here. So thanks, Oscar. So I'd like to thank everyone again and thank you. Did I know this one, Stephen? No, no. No, okay. Thanks very much. Thanks.